Angie Alamgear. I'm uh, the psychology lead for Bart's Pain Services, so that in includes um, My Lend and Roll London and Bart's. Um, and today I wanted to start off with um, a case study and discuss MUS and chronic pain and the ways we can maybe work together and really kind of support some of these complex patients and just a bit about referring to our service. Um, so for chronic pain, and maybe this can apply to other long-term health conditions, this is our, often the presentation we have in our, in our clinics or our GP practices. So we've got a kind of f a physical side and a psychological side. So physically, patients are very fear avoidant. They're very reluctant to move. They rarely leave the house. They don't want to move. They're, they feel like any movement creates is... Uh, pain equals damage, my spine's crumbling, uh, they're very suspicious about movement and they're very inclined to want to have bed rest. And obviously with that, uh, people are becoming more and more deconditioned, they're very reluctant to engage with physiotherapy. And obviously that's leading to this side where they're very fearful, very fear avoidant, low mood, depression and increased uh, perception of pain. So if I move, my pain's going to get worse, why should I move? And that's really challenging to deal with, isn't it, on both fronts. So, you know, if you give medication, that patient, you know, is not really going to, it's not going to uh, solve all these other things. And you send them to physio, it depends on whether they engage with it or not. So I wanted to kind of give you a case study of someone who has probably been seen by everyone. A 42-year-old female, two children, single, um, and the pain story often is, doesn't really fit with the actual presentation. So in 2010, she tells us she was seated on the upper deck of a bus, no prior pain history, says that the bus suddenly stopped and she hit her knees. And then since then, she, uh, some uh, tingling sensations, no injury, no trauma, no significant trauma, no breaks, no fractures. And she feels that things have never been the same. And she previously worked as a security guard but has stopped working. So what does she present with? So she's been diagnosed with fibromyalgia, poor sleep, migraines as well, depression, anxiety. She's been under rheumatology. Um, I'll go on to that in a minute. But very widespread pain problems now from the knee injury. Um, so what's she on and what's she been on? So she's on duloxetine, pregabalin, 300 BD, butrans, triptans, a whole host. And then she's been on previously fluoxetine, sertraline, and lefaxine propanolol. So she's been on quite a bit. Previous medical history and previous investigations. So I wasn't joking when I said she's seen... Um, so from the pain perspective, we've see, we see her in the pain clinic at Myland. She's also been under secondary care, had a lidocaine infusion, no help, been under rheumatology, still under rheumatology. They've said everything is fine. Investigations have come back um, normal. Um, for some reason, she's gone off to hand clinic now because she's kind of holding her hand like this. Um, and I don't think she's had carpal tunnel, um, but she's wearing a sling now. Uh, been under neurology, they've sent her to neuropsychiatry who, try, who are trying to reduce her butrans, <coughs> under psychology, hand therapy, respiratory, <coughs> orthopedics, and now gastro and physio, which she hasn't really engaged with. And this is a working diagnosis, and now what tends to happen is that's now at the top of every single letter. And whether that's helpful or not, whether that kind of... Uh, influences our perception of this patient when we when we see that diagnosis so how's this patient making us feel optimistic <laughs> she's i mean she's 42 and she's got quite a quite a history um and i'm wondering just in the room if we are faced with a patient like this do we feel oh my god overwhelmed i need to get her out of this room or has someone missed something am i going to be the one who's finally found what was wrong with her have I missed some serious pathology? Where can I refer her to next? Is she cure-seeking? And it could be all of those things, but, I mean, for someone who's 42 and has been through so much, and, you know, if you kind of think of the chronic pain and central sensitization, you know, the injury has <coughs> long healed, um, but her presentation doesn't really fit. 
And I guess the reason I'm asking this is this must be not very uncommon in our GP practices or clinics, particularly with chronic pain patients, but I guess other, what Peter was alluding to, other um, long-term conditions or complex um, health problems that we can have patients who have one presentation or one incident um, but come with a whole host. And so later on I'll be going on to discussion of what we can do to manage a patient like this and how maybe we stop some of that journey happening and working on what, what's actually in the room. So I found this diagram for MUS, but I don't think it's very clear. But I think, I don't know if the slides recirculated, so that might be a bit easier to read. And I think MUS can be helpful, but for chronic pain patients, sometimes it may not be. And there's a good uh, article written by Amanda Williams. I don't know what, what year is that, uh, 2011, about persistent pain and MUS. And just the, just the very nature of chronic pain patients, in, in my experience in chronic pain clinics, is they're very suspicious. Their sense is there's something wrong with them. You've missed some organic pathology. You know, if you just send me for another MRI, you'll find something. They've, you know, they've been very routinely investigated. Um, the spinal injection you gave me, you just did it on the wrong side. If you just try it again, or is there another medication that you could give me that, you know, something, you know. So there's this always a suspicion that you know you're withholding something or the MRI that you're not giving them is going to show something and even um, I was having a discussion with Peter in the break the disappointment on patients faces when you you um, discuss the MRI results and the MRI is normal and the disappointment that you've you've run a test and actually it's come back okay and that's that's really unusual because you would think in other settings you would be you know huge sense of relief but it doesn't fit with their correlation of their understanding of their illness um, so in some ways it can be helpful but I think if you go back to kind of really really kind of old pain here theories is that there is an interaction between physiological and psychological processing for for chronic pain and that really helps influence our understanding and and I think in terms of the way we explain pain, you know, we all have very short consultations. So there's an assumption that somewhere along the way, someone has explained to the patient the difference between acute pain and chronic pain. And often I use this as an interview question for um, people I hire in my team, whether it's physios or psychologists, is what's, what's your understanding of the difference between acute and chronic pain? Because patients often come in with the belief that the chronic pain they have is like acute pain. So I've got an injury and I must rest it and it needs to be healed. But after three months, that's not the case. And, you know, we talk about physical deconditioning. We talk about uh, central sensitization, the fact that, you know, your nervous system is like an overexcited car alarm that goes off when it's stormy, but no one's breaking in. But, and sometimes you see, a, oh, no one's spoken to me about that. But often it's that, that uh, the perception that pain is damaged. So if I bend and I have a sharp shooting pain down, going down my leg, that must mean my body's saying I shouldn't do that again. And that kind of leads back to that cycle, um, the, one of the earlier slides. So I think this is quite um, a good sort of theory to talk about. Um, and I think again, just about, just thinking about the broader spectrum is quite important. Um, and I think one of the unhelpful things of MUS is, let's say, a patient, sometimes we've run pain management programs where some patients have a diagnosis of fibromyalgia, ls loss, and some patients just have just chronic pain. And the kind of, the behavior of a patient who has, oh, I've got this diagnosis, I'm different, I'm special, and their ability to want to engage with any sort of self-management is very different, it, it's, it's quite challenging because what we don't want is any kind of a block or something that will block any kind of engagement with rehab. And that's one of my concerns with putting patients in a la label that you've got something magically unknown that we don't know about, so we need further investigations, and so you shouldn't engage with anything. So it can be quite tricky. So one of the things, um, oh, sorry for moving. I know the cameraman said not to move. <laughs> so just a quick one. Um, so I, I was thinking, look, we've all got really um, kind of overwhelming patients, really complex. Is there anything we can all do to kind of um, think of ways to kind of support these patients? So I was thinking, 
and I, I'm thinking for us as well. Um, and I kind of grouped it into four. So assessment, investigations, reassurance, and explanation. Um, and it, sorry, it's, a, it's very wordy. Um, but just in terms of assessment, because I think sometimes the patient comes in, we might have an automatic assumption, we've looked through their notes, oh my god, their EMIS notes are so long. And just, um, just looking, asking the patient, what's a typical day like? What are your symptoms stopping you from doing? Um, and also um, just giving them explanations with, which fit with their worldview, not that kind of medical jargon that they won't engage with. Um, in the assessment, removing any blame from them. Um, looking at how they can manage their symptoms and this is really quite early on if we try and do this earlier on in that patient journey that we won't get that big fat file or the big emis notes um, and investigations and I think this is a really key area because I think that's one of the reasons why um, I raised the, the patient in the beginning because she's had so many investigations that really aren't telling us anything so looking at previous notes um, patients will say, oh, you know, the brain insists on having an MRI or bloods or anything like that. But, you know, discussing with the patient what you expect and what an MRI, for example, can show you and what it can't show you. Um, um, does this patient really need this investigation? And that reassurance, and obviously if you have health anxiety, there's, there's a limit to how much reassurance can offer. But what you expect to find, and I think that's been discussed earlier, but what you expect to find in an in, in investigation, what you don't expect to find. And I've written magical MRI here because, I mean, th this is what we were talking about earlier, um, that disappointment if the MRI is normal. And um, the reassurance. So often our patients... Cancer is a big one, but I'm going to end up in a wheelchair. So, you know, I'd better not move. I'd better be really cautious and preserve all my energy. Um, but, you know, we're seeing more and more younger patients refer to our clinic, you know, under 30s. Uh, I saw a 38-year-old man in, um, at Bart's today who um, had spinal surgery 10 years ago. His wife's given up full-time work. He has his whole family doing everything for him. He wanted a spinal cord stimulator. Um, and his home has met out all the um, adjustments, he doesn't go out alone, he can't do any self-care, he can go to the toilet on his own, and the whole setup is there for a 38-year-old, so what's going to happen to him in 10 years' time? And that's why I asked him today. Um, so just to kind of think about, well, what are your fears? But again, trying to elicit some sort of motivation from them, you know, if you're only going out for medical appointments, what's, you know, what's your value in life? What, you know, what, what's important to you? What's your, is this illness defining your life? Um, and I think, oh, um, and also kind of integrating kind of physical and psychological explanations. So for example, anxiety is a key one, the impact that stress can have on your body, that, that you're, you know, you can convince yourself you're having a heart attack if you are so stressed and wound up with the heavy breathing, the symptoms can be very similar. And I think explanations, particularly for chronic pain, are really, really key. The fact that patients are from viewing their pain from the worldview of acute pain. So if I touch a hot stove, it means not to touch it, it means damaging. So I better not do it. But again, with chronic pain, it's completely different. The backs are strong, bodies are designed to move, bodies aren't designed to kind of take meds and sleep all day. That's not the way things work and that's not what's going to be helpful. Um, so, and also I was just thinking about what would be helpful when we refer on to different specialities, um, what's helpful for us, giving us enough information so we know. Often I get the one-liner, because we're on a single point of access form, I get a one-liner, chronic low back pain. That doesn't tell me anything. So I need to know, you know, what's, what's it stopping them from doing? What meds have they been on? What's worked? What hasn't worked? What are they willing to engage with? Um, and also, I often use uh, my description of chronic pain as um, viewing it as diabetes. You know, you've got a long-term condition, you have to make lifestyle changes. You know, it's not going to suddenly disappear, but you have to work with it rather than this sort of resistance. And I think that's where the kind of acceptance and commitment approach, the ACT approach, really works well, with, rather than that kind of struggle, but working with it. So I was just thinking about kind of our kind of service approach. And, you know, so what we try and do here, but the listening and the validation, I think that really links back to uh, the two videos we saw as well. Some of those patients feeling like they'd not been listened to, they'd not been validated and feeling heard. Um, but also this bit is key, serious, no serious disease. So what do we do? So we're an MDT team. 
consisting of pain, uh, pain consultants, psychologists uh, and physiotherapists. We are uh, on the kind of single point of access, um, what's it called, IMAPS form. I know it's recently changed, so it's on IMAPS form. I don't know whether any of you have referred to the service, so we're kind of linked up with physio. But if you refer to us, I will do the triage and then triage appropriately to one of these clinics, whether they need uh, an MDT, whether they need a physio or psychology. So all the clinics are run jointly in the beginning and then they can be offered. And one of the things we try and do is opioid management and reduction, uh, pain physio, pain psychology, but also pain management programs. And the key thing is we do them in English and in Bengali. And, and the response has been fantastic because the patients, particularly Bengali ladies, really engage very well with it. We run at uh, 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock at Royal London Hospital. We've tried and tested lots of different times, but we found that time of the day works well because it doesn't interfere with school times and uh, school pickup times. So that tends to work very well. But they're very, very engaged with the kind of model of exercising and self-management and, you know, valued activities. And what we do hope is that by doing this sort of thing, that we're reducing repeated GP consultations, referring on elsewhere, re uh, reducing secondary care uh, referrals, uh, reducing medication intake. Sorry, I, Peter. <laughs> Peter's slide. It's a, it's a very well-used well slide. But again, so obviously we would look at the red flags, and this bit would be excluded by the medic, but it's very rare that we ever have any patient that has some sort of significant um, organic pathology that's very rarely called a quina, but anything significant has come up. Um, but this is, this is, these bits are the key here, because really this is the word about the adjustment, and essentially that's what we're trying to do. We're helping patients adjust to a long-term condition and make sense of it. Um, and this is one of our pieces of work we've done recently about... Um, by um, Jane Gallagher about um, opioid reduction. So that was a big project here. And what we do hope is that by doing all of this, by working together with a kind of CBT evidence-based approach, we can achieve some of this and we do see this. And it also depends on where we get this patient in the pain journey, how much they're willing to engage. And some of these bits, if we can chip away at them, it doesn't happen overnight. It does take time and it does take um, a lot of work of working within a team. It, it's not a single practitioner approach. And this is a good video. So I didn't put the link in, but I put enough detail. So if you wanted to go on YouTube, this is a really good video um, that's describes chronic pain, it's an Australian video, but describes pain in about five minutes in a kind of cartoon drawing format, but it's really, really good, and the patients really like it. So that's quite a good video, and we use this in, often in our pain management programs, and patients find it helpful. So I've whizzed through, because I'm weird of time, but thank you.